Greetings, bookworms, and welcome to the Bearded Book Club's production of Dragons of Autumn Twilight by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. If you want to follow along in this and all of our productions, make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications so you will be notified of all new videos as well as when we do our live shows. If you would like to support Bearded Book Club, you could do so in two ways, both of which are listed in this video's description. Number one, you could become a member of the YouTube channel and or become a patron and support us on a regular basis. Or number two, you can go to our Amazon wish list and send us a book as a one-time donation. So without further ado, let us continue. Chapter 13 Chill Dawn, Vine Bridges, Dark Water Tennis felt clawed, clawed hands clutching at his throat. He struggled and fought, then woke to find Riverwind bending over him in the darkness, shaking him roughly. What? Tannis sat up. You were dreaming, the plainsman said grimly. I had to wake you. Your shouts would draw an army down on us. Yes, thanks, Tannis muttered. I'm sorry. He sat up, trying to shake off the nightmare. What time is it? Still several hours till dawn, Riverwind said wearily. He returned to where he had been sitting, his back against the trunk of a twisted tree. Goldmoon lay sleeping on the ground beside him. She began to murmur and shake her head, making soft, small moaning cries like a wounded animal. Riverwind stroked her silver-gold hair and she quieted. You should have wakened me earlier, Tannis said. He stood up rubbing his shoulders and neck. It's my watch. Do you think I could sleep? asked Riverwind bitterly. You've got to, Tannis answered. You'll slow us up if you don't. The men in my tribe can travel for many days without sleep, Riverwind said. His eyes were dull and glazed, and he seemed to stare at nothing. Tannis started to argue, then sighed and kept quiet. He knew that he could never truly understand the agony the plainsman was suffering. To have friends and family, an entire life, utterly destroyed, must be so devastating that the mind shrank from even imagining it. Tannis left him and walked over to where Flint was sitting, carving at a piece of wood. You might as well get some sleep, Tannis told the dwarf. I'll watch for a while. Flint nodded. I heard you yelling over there. He sheathed his dagger and thrust the piece of wood into a pouch. Defending Kwushu. Tannis frowned at the memory. Shivering in the chill night, he wrapped his cloak around him, drew up his hood. Any idea where we are? he asked Flint. The plainsman says we're on a road known as Sageway East, the dwarf answered. He stretched out on the cold ground, dragging a blanket up around his shoulders. Some old highway. It's been around since before the cataclysm. I don't suppose we've been fortunate enough to have this road take us to Zak Zaroth. Riverwind doesn't seem to think so, the dwarf mumbled sleepily. Says he's only followed it a short distance, but at least it gets us through the mountains. He gave a great yawn and turned over, pillowing his head on his cloak. Tennis breathed deeply. The night seemed peaceful enough. They hadn't run into any draconians or goblins in their wild flight from Kyushu. As Raceland said, apparently the draconians had attacked Kyushu in search of the staff, not as part of any preparation for battle. They had struck and then withdrawn. The Forest Master's time limit still held good. Tannis supposed Zaxaroth within two days, and one day had already passed. Shivering, the half-elf walked back over to Riverwind. Do you have any idea how far we have to go and in what direction? Tannis crouched down next to the plainsman. Yes, Riverwind nodded, rubbing his eyes. We must go to the northeast toward New Sea. That is where the city is rumored to be. I have never been there, he frowned and shook his head. I've never been there, he repeated. Can we reach it by tomorrow? Tannis asked. New Sea is said to be two days' journey from Kyushu. The barbarian sighed, if Zak Zaroth exists, we should be able to reach it in a day, though I have heard that the land from here to New Sea is swampy and difficult to travel. He shut his eyes, his hand absently stroking Goldmoon's hair. Tannis fell silent, hoping the plainsman would sleep. The half-elf moved quietly to sit beneath the tree, staring into the night. He made a mental note to ask Tasselhoff in the morning if he had a map. The kender did have a map, but it wasn't much help, dating as it did before the cataclysm. 
Nusi wasn't on the map since it had appeared after the land had been torn apart and the waters of Turbidus Ocean had rushed in to fill it. Still, the map showed Zoxaroth only a short distance from the highway marked Sageway East. They should reach it in some time that afternoon if the territory they had to cross wasn't impassable. The companions ate a cheerless breakfast, most forcing the food down without appetite. Raceland brewed his foul-smelling herbal drink over the small fire, his strange eyes lingering on Goldmoon's staff. How precious it has become, he commented softly, now that it has been purchased by the blood of innocence. Is it worth it? Is it worth the lives of my people? Goldmoon asked, staring at the nondescript brown staff dully. She seemed to have aged during the night. Gray circles smudged the skin beneath her eyes. None of the companions answered, each looking away in awkward silence. Riverwind stood up abruptly and stalked off into the woods by himself. Goldmoon lifted her eyes and stared after him. Then her head sank into her hands and she began to weep silently. He blames himself. She shook her head, and I am not helping him. It wasn't his fault. It's not anyone's fault, Tannis said slowly, walking over to her. He put his hand on her shoulder, rubbing out the tenseness he felt in the bunched muscles of her neck. We can't understand. We've just got to keep going and hope we find the answer in Zaxarath. She nodded and wiped her eyes, drew a deep breath, and blew her nose on a handkerchief Tasselhoff handed her. You're right, she said, swallowing. My father would be ashamed of me. I must remember, I am Chieftain's daughter. No, came Riverwind's deep voice from where he stood behind her in the shadow of the trees. You are Chieftain. Goldmoon gasped. She twisted to her feet to stare wide-eyed at Riverwind. Perhaps I am, she faltered, but it is meaningless. Our people are dead. I saw tracks, Riverwind answered. Some managed to flee. They have probably gone into the mountains. They will return, and you will be their ruler. Are people still alive? Goldmoon's face became radiant. Not many, maybe none now. It would depend on whether or not the Draconians followed them into the mountains, Riverwind shrugged. Still, you are now their ruler. Bitterness crept into his voice, and I will be husband of chieftain. Goldmoon cringed as though he had struck her. She blinked and shook her head. No, Riverwind, she said softly. I, we've talked. Have we? He interrupted. I was thinking about it last night. I've been gone so many years. My thoughts were of you as a woman. I did not realize. He swallowed and then drew a deep breath. I left, Goldmoon. I returned to find Chieftain's daughter. What choice did I have? Goldmoon cried angrily. My father wasn't well. I had to rule or Lorman would have taken over the tribe. Do you know what it's like being Chieftain's daughter? Wondering at every meal if this morsel is the one with the poison? Struggling every day to find the money in the treasury to pay the soldiers so that Lorman won't have no excuse to take over. And all the time I must act as chieftain's daughter while my father sits and drools and mumbles. Her voice choked with tears. Riverwind listened, his face stern and unmoving. He stared at a point above her head. We should get started, he said coldly. It's nearly dawn. The companions had traveled only a few de miles in the cold, broken road when it dumped them literally into a swamp. They had noticed that the ground was getting spongier and the tall, sturdy trees of the mountain canyon forest dwindled. Strange, twisted trees rose up before them. A miasma blotted out the sun and the air became foul to breathe. Raceland began to cough and he covered its mouth with a handkerchief. They stayed on the broken stones of the old road, avoiding the dank, swampy ground next to it. Flint was walking in front with Tasselhoff when suddenly the dwarf gave a great shout and disappeared into the muck. They could see only his head. Help the dwarf, Taz shouted, and the others ran up. It's dragging me under, Flint flailed about the black, oozing mud in panic. Hold still, Riverwind cautioned. You have fallen in death murk. Don't go in after him, he warned Sturm, who had leapt forward. You'll both die. Get a branch. Kerman grabbed a young sapling, took a deep breath, and grunted and pulled. They could hear its roots snapping and creaking as the huge warrior dragged it out of the ground. Riverwind stretched out flat, extending the branch to the dwarf. Flint, nearly up to his nose in the slimy muck, thrashed about and finally grabbed hold of it. 
The warrior hauled the tree out of the death murk, the dwarf clinging to it. Tannis, the kender clutched at the half-elf and pointed. A snake as big around as Caraman's arm slithered into the ooze right where the dwarf had been floundering. We can't walk through this, Tannis gestured at the swamp. Maybe we should turn back. No time, Raceland whispered, his hourglass eyes glittering. And there is no other way, Riverwind said, his voice sounding strange. And we can get through. I know a path. What? Tennis turned to him. I thought you said... I've been here, the plainsman said in a strangled voice. I can't remember when, but I've been here. I know the way through the swamp, and it leads to... He licked his lips. Leads to a broken city of evil, Tannis asked grimly when the plainsman did not finish his sentence. Zox Saroth, Raislin hissed. Of course, Tannis said softly, it makes sense. Where do we go to find answers about the staff except to the place where the staff was given you? And we must go now, said Raislin insistently. We must be there by midnight tonight. The plainsman took the lead. He found firm ground around the black water and, making them all walk single file, led them away from the road and deeper into the swamp. Trees that he called Iron Claw rose out of the water, their roots standing exposed, twisting into the mud. Vines drooped from their branches and trailed across the faint path. The mist closed in, and soon no one could see beyond a few feet. They were forced to move slowly, testing every step. A false move, and they would have plunged into the stinking morass that lay foul and stagnant all around them. Suddenly the trail came to an end in dark swamp water. Now what? Caraman asked gloomily. This, Riverwind said, pointing. A crude bridge made out of vines twisted into ropes was attached to a tree. It spanned the water like a spider web. Who built it? Tannis asked. I don't know, Riverwind said, but you will find them all along the path, wherever it becomes impassable. I told you Zox Saroth would not remain abandoned, Raceland whispered. Yes, well, I suppose we shouldn't throw stones at a gift of the gods, replied Tannis. At least we don't have to swim. The journey across the vine bridge was not pleasant. The vines were coated with slimy moss which made walking precarious. The structure swayed alarmingly when touched, and its motion became erratic when anyone crossed. They made it safely to the other side, but had walked only a short distance before they were forced to use another bridge and always below them and around them was the dark water, where strange eyes watched them hungrily. Then they reached a point where the firm ground ended and there was no vine bridges. Ahead was nothing but slimy water. It isn't very deep, Riverwind muttered. Follow me. Step only where I step. Riverwind took a step, then another step, feeling his way, the rest keeping right behind him staring into the water. They stared in disgust and alarm as unknown and unseen things slithered past their legs. When they reached firm ground again, their legs were coated with slime, all of them gagging from the smell. But this last journey seemed perhaps to have been the worst. The jungle growth was not as thick, and they could even see the sun shining faintly through a green haze. The farther north they traveled, the firmer the terrain became. By midday, Tannis called a halt where he found a dry patch of ground beneath an ancient oak tree. The companions sank down to eat lunch and speak hopefully of leaving the swamp behind them. All except Goldmoon and Riverwind. They spoke not at all. Flint's clothes were sopping wet. He shook with the cold and began complaining about pain in his joints. Tannis grew worried. He knew the dwarf was subject to rheumatism and remembered what Flint had said about fearing to slow them up. Tannis tapped the kinder and gestured him over to one side. I know you've got something in one of your pouches that would take the chill off the dwarf's bones, if you know what I mean, Tannis said softly. Oh, sure, Tannis, Tass said, brightening. He fumbled around, first in one pouch, then another, and finally came up with a gleaming silver flask. Brandy, Odic's finest. I don't suppose you paid for it, Tannis asked, grinning. I will, the kinder replied hurt, next time I'm there. Sure, Tannis, Tannis patted him on the shoulder. Share some with Flint. Not too much, he cautioned. Just warm him up. All right, we'll take the lead, we mighty warriors. Taz laughed and skipped over to the dwarf as Tannis returned to the others. 
They were silently packing up the remains of lunch and preparing to move out. All of us could use some of Odic's finest, he thought. Goldmoon and Riverwind had not spoken to each other all morning. Their moods spread a pall on everyone. Tannis could think of nothing to do that would end the torture these two were experiencing. He could only hope that time would salve the wounds. The companions continued along the trail for about an hour after lunch, moving more quickly since the thickest part of the jungle had been left behind. Just as they thought they had left the swamp forever, the firm ground came abruptly to an end. Weary, sick with the smell and discourage, the company found themselves wading through the muck once again. Only Flint and Tasselhoff were unaffected by the return of the swamp. These two had ranged far ahead of the others. Tasselhoff soon forgot Tannis's warning about drinking only a little of the brandy. The liquid warmed the blood and took the edge off the gloomy atmosphere. So the Kender and Dwarf passed the flask back and forth many times until it was empty and they were traipsing along making jokes about what they would do if they encountered a draconian. I'd turn into stone right away, the Dwarf said, swinging an imaginary battle axe. Wham! Right in the lizard's gizzard. I'll bet Raisin could turn one to stone with a look, Tass imitated the mage's grim face and dour stare. They both laughed loudly, then hushed, giggling, peering back unsteadily to see if Tannis had heard them. I'll bet Caraman stick a fork in one and eat it, Flint said. Taz choked with laughter and wiped tears from his eyes. The dwarf roared. Suddenly the two came to the end of the spongy ground. Tasselhoff grabbed hold of the dwarf as Flint nearly plunged headfirst into a pool of swamp water so wide that a vine bridge would not span it. A huge iron claw tree lay across the water its thick trunk making a bridge wide enough for two people to walk across side by side. Now this is a bridge, Flint said, stepping back a pace and trying to bring the log into focus. No more spider crawling on those stupid green webs. Let's go. Shouldn't we wait for the others? Tasselhoff asked mildly. Tannis wouldn't want us to get separated. Tannis, <laughs> the dwarf sniffed, we'll show him. All right, Tasselhoff agreed cheerfully. He leapt up onto the fallen tree. Careful, he said, slipping slightly, then easily catching his balance. It's slick. He took a few quick steps, arms outstretched. His feet pointed out like a rope walker he'd seen once at a summer fair. The dwarf clambered up after the kender, Flint's thick boots clumping clumsily on the log. A voice in the unbrandied part of Flint's mind told him he could... Never have done this cold sober. It also told him he was a fool for crossing the bridge without waiting for the others, but he ignored it. He was feeling positively young again. Tasselhoff, enchanted with pretending he was Murgo the Magnificent, looked up and discovered that he did indeed have an audience. One of those draconian things leapt onto the log in front of him. The sight sobered Tass up rapidly. The kender was not given to fear, but he was certainly amazed. He had presence of mind enough to do two things. First he yelled out loud, loudly, Tannis, ambush! Then he lifted his hoopak staff and swung it in a wide arc. The move took the draconian by surprise. The creature sucked in its breath and jumped back off the log to the bank below. Taz, momentarily off balance, regained his feet quickly and wondered what to do next. He glanced around and saw another draconian on the bank. They were, he was puzzled to notice, not armed. Before he could consider this oddity, he heard a roar behind him. He had forgotten the dwarf. What is it? Flint shouted. Draco thingamajiggers, Tass said, gripping his hoopack and peering through the mist. Two ahead, here they come. Well, confound it, get out of my way, Flint snarled. Reaching behind, he fumbled for his axe. Where am I supposed to go? Tass shouted wildly. Duck! yelled the dwarf. The kender ducked, throwing himself down on the log as one of the draconians came toward him, its clawed hands outstretched. Flint swung his axe in a mighty blow that would have decapitated the draconian if it had come anywhere near it. Unfortunately, the dwarf miscalculated and the blade whistled harmlessly in front of the draconian, who was waving its hands in the air and chanting strange words. The momentum of Flint's swing spun the dwarf around. His feet slipped on the slimy log, and with a loud cry, the dwarf tumbled backward into the water. 
Tasselhoff, having been around Raceland for years, recognized that the Draconian was casting a magic spell. Lying face down on the log, his hoopak staff clutched in his hand, the kender figured he had about one and a half seconds to consider what to do. The dwarf was gasping and spluttering in the water beneath him. Not inches away, the Draconian was clearly reaching a stunning conclusion to his spellcasting. Deciding that anything was better than being magic, Taz took a deep breath and dove off the log. Tannis, ambush! Damn, swore Karaman as the kender's voice floated to them out of the mist somewhere ahead. They all began running toward the sound, cursing the vines and the tree branches that blocked their way. Crashing out through the forest, they saw the fallen Iron Claw Bridge. Four draconians ran out of the shadows, blocking their path. Suddenly, the companions were plunged into darkness too thick to see their own hands, much less their comrades. Magic, Tannis heard Raceland hiss. These are magic users. Stand aside. You cannot fight them. Then Tannis heard the mage cry out in agony. Raced, Caraman shouted. We're, uh... There was a groan and the sound of a heavy body thudding to the ground. Tannis heard the Draconians chanting. Even as he fumbled for his sword, he was suddenly covered head to toe in a thick, gooey substance that clogged up his nose and mouth. Struggling to free himself, he only enmeshed himself further. He heard Sturm swearing next to him. Goldmoon cried out. Riverwind's voice was choked off. Then drowsiness overcame him. Tannis sank to his knee, still fighting to free himself from the web-like substance that glued his hands to his sides. Then he fell forward on his face and sank into an unnatural sleep. <laughs>